So uh, the talk is flying air glow, I understand. So we have to show you pictures of flying air glow, but most of you people probably seen air glow fly. Uh, and the founding members of Team Air Glow, Robin and myself. But I have to put up the originals because the originals are John McIntyre uh, and Nick Weston. And we hope both of them would be here today uh, and to answer a few questions because there's still a lot of mystery about the original flying of Airglow. Some missing pieces, uh, not the least of them being uh, brother Mark um, McIntyre, uh, who did a lot, he did 50% of the beautiful engineering that goes into, uh, into Airglow, particularly the, the thing that always catches me in my eye is the gearbox. Uh, wonderful shiny piece of uh, mechanical architecture that he made on a tiny little micro blade uh, in his father's workshop. Uh, it's a wondrous thing. So we've cribbed a few pictures, uh, uh, and that's Nick Weston uh, and Pierre Frank, I think. Do you, do you know who those picture, people in the pictures are? Yeah, that's, that's what it says on my website. Yeah. That's, uh, that's Airglow, that's Nick and uh, John and Pierre, I think, at Mendelheim. Uh, so Nick and John and Nick. Uh, to meet up with Pierre, because uh, 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 not forgetting that uh, Airglow and uh, Bel Air were being designed and built pretty much concurrently. I think that was a Duxford, though. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Quite that, one? Yeah. that one? That yeah. one? I think, uh, <coughs> anyway, I thought I'd show this picture of Airglow because it shows original Airglow uh, logo and some original Airglow. Uh, foil and, and various other configurations and we understand it's had several rebuilds uh, and uh, some of that's possibly Can quite I a repair. Hands up to how many people know the, um, the timeline of the Bear Glow, um, when it was built um, and how it came to be. <laughs> 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 um, and for those who don't know, um, Air Glow is a result of um, John having completed his masters in shipbuilding design, deciding that uh, actually he quite fancied getting involved in human power flight uh, and spending some time with the uh, MIT NASA uh, group out in uh, Crete uh, in 1988 when they flew Daedalus, uh, the uh, 32, 34 meter wingspan aircraft across the Aegean Sea to the Isle of Santorini, setting a new and un as yet unbroken uh, distance and duration record. Uh, John spent time out there taking lots of photographs, uh, making lots of notes, sketches. Uh, he was already at the time in the process of building Airglow uh, and I understand had received a grant from the Royal Aeronautical Society for materials with which to build it. Um, and it's reasonably easy to see once you start looking closely at Airglow that there are a number of um, design uh, features and detail uh, in Airglow that's, that, that come from uh, the Daedalus and the, the Light Eagle um, heritage. Um, the the, the um, quality of build and construction is fairly impeccable, I have to say, and. Uh, um, being having been allowed to um, to use it and work it work on it and alter it has uh, been um, an honour. Uh, it's also been deeply worrying because of the, the the possibility of maybe stuffing it up by uh, inappropriate engineering. Uh, John has been very su supportive of us uh, uh, through our short period of time uh, of. Uh, uh, custodial uh, ownership um, has encouraged us to uh, make the changes as we see fit. He re very much regards it as a developmental machine that people should um, learn from and enjoy. That seems to have been his, uh, the mainstay of his uh, purpose in building it, is that it should be a, a, a project that provided enjoyment and fun uh, for, the, for those who are involved in it, which it has been. Uh, for instance, um, we've been doing beavering away at uh, a, uh, a rough ground undercarriage conversion that might allow us to better performance on takeoff from grass, and we've been 
pontificating over what should we should do with it and uh, John's attitude when he discovered what we were doing saying you're being too precious just cut holes in it and do what it is that you want to do it'll be fine um, and uh, which is a great a, a great attitude um, Airglow uh, spent some nine years I think from uh, from being built uh, to being put away in its box at the end of uh, uh, somebody's garden uh, up near Cambridge uh, during which time uh, John who only flew it once or twice I think uh, and his teenage uh, cycling glider pilot um, uh, chap, uh, young chap Nick Weston uh, flew and developed the aircraft um, messing around with basic settings which John had calculated almost exactly on right from the word go um, uh, it flew you know, within, a, within a few flights they had had, had it trimmed uh, and were able to um, conduct uh, stable flights over, over some distance uh, they had also looked at um, uh, uh, all the other, it had originally been designed with uh, rotating tip um, sections to, to give them a, uh, a degree of roll control. Uh, this was later abandoned, uh, and we were um, it, it, uh, it was recommended by John when we took uh, uh, took charge of the aircraft that we uh, uh, forget about those, um, lock the incidents on the tip fins because they uh, they had had limited. Uh, almost negligible um, uh, roll um, effect, uh, given the, the the amount of um, deflection that they were they were, they were allowed to, to give. So um, they also uh, had a little go with a um, uh, a little V twin. I think how many horsepower bill? Would have been about one to one and a half. A, a one one and a half horsepower uh, aero model, large scale aero model engine, which they. Uh, mounted on the boom, having taken the uh, the, the upper prop uh, shaft off and the, the prop assembly and the pedals, they mounted a, a glued on a, uh, uh, a hanger uh, and a mount for this engine and um, uh, conducted some trials with that. I'm not sure what to what end, although they did manage to find their way through VNE. Uh, I, I understand it was all quite hairy. Uh, and there is a photograph somewhere I don't know whether Roger's got it of a rather sad looking uh, air glow sat um, it's on the, oh, it's on the um, prop designer website uh, you put it there uh, <laughs> of air glow on, 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 uh, in, a, in a dusky uh, um, runway environment uh, with the king posts having collapsed and, and the wings down on the floor and that's one of the flights where they had the uh, uh, the, the motor attached and uh, they had an issue with um, uh, the fly-by wire control uh, uh, which John had done a, a quick repair on and it had failed in flight and he lost pitch control and it um, it did a Brooks on him and um, a, a better fly Brooks on him <laughs> uh, stuffed, uh, stuffed into the grounds uh, uh, while on the subject of fly-by wire uh, one of the influences from Daedalus that didn't come across was the mechanical control system, uh, a wonderfully intricate uh, uh, system on the Daedalus machine. Uh, did not come across onto, uh, onto Airglow. He deci uh, John decided to go for fly-by-wire um, with um, <coughs> use of uh, off-the-shelf conventional aero model servos uh, and a, um, a home-designed uh, controller uh, with a um, a conventional uh, yoke arrangement in the cockpit. Uh, would you like to contribute now, uh, Mr. Warren? Sorry, I've been prattling. Uh, following up on that, uh, those controls, and uh, that uh, actually John has machined up a whole lot of parts for mechanical control, so he actually did consider it for a long time, uh, and probably got most of the way to installing it. And the conversation yesterday was. Uh, he decided that it was just too fiddly uh, and that the fly-by-wire was just quick and easy to set up and get going. So uh, uh, that's, that's the way they took it and it's been pretty much the same ever since. We took control of the aircraft uh, when 
uh, I was working with Robin and Bill in 2010 I started that Christmas uh, Bill turned up from Cambridge yeah, with the trailer right. New, New Year's Day 2011 New Year's you really Day. had nothing better else to do. I can't imagine what your wife said. Uh, and uh, I, I possibly had gone back to New Zealand at that, that time. I came back and there was something to play with. So uh, um, we'd, uh, uh, um, we, we started with what we could. We took it out of the box, uh, started looking at what was there, and it was all in very good condition. Uh, Amazingly and, good condition. Uh, identified a number of uh, things that were, weren't working. We weren't sure about the whether to install the rotating tips. Uh, we looked at the bearings and quickly realised that they were just weight and rusty weight at that and took them off. Uh, fixed, fixed the wings, uh, the tips and worked out the dihedral. I think we suspended the whole aircraft in, in, the, in P&M's space, lifted it up and Bill eyeballed it and said, yeah, about that much. <laughs> Seize it there. <laughs> and uh, there it was ever since and it's been pretty good. Uh, we have tried to change it, and uh, we've gone back to the way it was. Um, uh, the, uh, what part of the controls changes we undertook was putting in lighter servos, so we kept the fly-by-wire, we just identified better servos, and uh, we, I think we've replaced them a second time uh, for smaller and lighter again. Um, uh, replaced the chair, the chair, we got a new bit of canvas, um, and polished up the prop blades, um, but pretty much it was flyable within a, within a month. Uh, and our te first test flight was fairly hairy, talking about test flights, I haven't got it on here, but that's the first month in p &M. so we, you know, it was, since then you might notice that we've destroyed this part of the windscreen, having taken it off a couple of times, so we've patched that up and we've patched it up down here, but it was a very good windscreen when it came to us. Uh, but otherwise, it's uh, much the same. So it was a very good build, very good bit of engineering. Apart from uh, the controls, which were good, somewhat basic, would strike your knee a bit. Uh, but that's a picture inside the cockpit, and it's very cramped. Uh, so one of our mods, possibly after Bill pulled off the control frame. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to fly it like a Cessna. I was trying to flare out. I pulled the entire yoke assembly out of the, yeah. <laughs> so you can see here, this is roll. Uh, that's pitch control on your thumb. So you rotate the whole thing uh, backwards and forwards. And then it had... Yes, then you put a push-pull uh, for your. So uh, originally it was a three-axis aeroplane with, uh, so that you could um, uh, potentially make coordinated turns. Um, without the use of, uh, of your feet. So very good, aside from the fact, from John's um, uh, account, is that the, uh, uh, the rotating tips didn't actually give um, uh, a, a, ro a roll effect. So um, uh, we decided to dispense with it. Something that we, uh, now that we've got yeah, uh, the aircraft in its current con uh, configuration, which we've pretty much locked in since uh, 2011 with this fairly generous dihedral value um, we've discovered it's got the lateral and spiral stability that's that, that we need or that it brings uh, that brings those elements uh, within bounds of control something that uh, uh, the previous chap talking I can't remember what his name is uh, Roman. so Roman Raymond Raymond I uh, was talking about uh, uh, we've got that element of stability in the aircraft that um, dispenses per, uh, really with the, uh, the, the real need for roll control in the aircraft and highlights the fact that these, to us at least, that flying human powered aircraft with such large wingspans really demands uh, ultra calm weather conditions. Uh, the uh, uh, performance of the aircraft and its controllability uh, is markedly different uh, over a very small uh, wind speed range. If, you, uh, if you've got less than a knot uh, wind blowing from any direction then 
it's a control of the aeroplane it will do it will go in the direction you want it to go uh, in both axes up and down left and right at your bidding uh, you had you had another couple of knots of winds in there uh, with any uh, topographical disturbance local topographical disturbance then you're getting unequal wing loadings you're getting gust factors uh, and it all becomes a lot uh, uh, a lot less forgiving an aeroplane and much more difficult to control so that's something that's one of the things that we have learned uh, over the past four years uh, uh, is that you pick your moments when to fly uh, and we're also uh, part of our development program is um, uh, learning to that, that we can potentially reconfigure the aircraft in terms of span uh, and equipment uh, to uh, make it uh, controllable over a greater uh, wind, uh, range of wind speeds. Talking about local uh, topographical variations, so some of the things that come up quite regularly is when we're flying over seal and over grass, you get a different response in one wing over one and one over the other. You, uh, you've got quite a lot of lifting air on a warm day. Uh, or a warm morning even, or, or even at the end of the day, you've got a lot of lift coming off the, off the seal. Uh, and I'm fairly sure, being the heaviest pilot, my first flight seemed very easily after being fighting all day. It was the last flight of the evening. It was getting dusk like Robin was uh, the flight the other Saturday. And uh, all of a sudden, I put a bit of extra effort in, but popped it up nicely and it stayed up, and it was all over a hot seal. Got all the way to the end of the keys and thought, well, it's dark, I can't see any, anything beyond that, but the keys have put it down. Um, so yes, th there is lots of uh, local response. And, and this morning, we've debated about going out so early, just getting in a, you know, too much moisture, the change in temperature. As soon as the sun came up, we started getting a little bit of lift, and I think that makes the difference. Uh, so it's very sensitive. Uh, one of the contentious modifications that we did uh, was uh, an extension of the crank. Um, it was discussed at, uh, at long length and, and, and it was decided as a team that we needed to move it ahead. Uh, how much it moved uh, was discussed, but uh, it, it went to the length it did, which is probably a bit longer than the rest of us anticipated. So we had some very good short pilots and unfortunately they can't fly the aircraft so well anymore. But this is the process of us removing the, the fuzz. Uh, and uh, it's probably the time we damaged the screen, actually. Uh, and extending out and bracing it in the carbon on the nose there. You can see what we're doing, adding this work in. I think you added in a tube as a former, didn't you? Correct, yes. Uh, and then extended it out. Uh, and a very good modification in the end. It, uh, Robin was very anxious, having not done much carbon work. Uh, how good it would turn out, but uh, it's probably some of the best carbon work I've seen. It's, he, he spent a long time getting it just right and perfecting it, and by the time we only just got it done in time for uh, the Icarus Cup at Siwal, but uh, so we hadn't test flown it, I think, even before Siwal. Uh, but the preparation had gone into it. Uh, the other discussion is that we couldn't really move the seat back. There might be one or two mill we could get, or maybe even 10 centimetres, 10, 10 millimetres a centimetre to move the seat back, but it's not <coughs> going to gain a, what Robin needed, and he was our best performing pilot at the time, so uh, we've still got some debate about what to do to, to keep our range of pilots there, because it's very useful to have a range of pilots. This has highlighted the, um, the absolute need to um, have control over the centre of gravity in an aircraft of this nature. On a powered aircraft, um, three axis uh, machine, central gravity is, uh, is very important, of course. However, there's uh, a reasonably generous range of COG that you uh, can get away with uh, in terms of you can balance out um, your, uh, your, st your stability uh, by um, aer aerodynamically with a um, uh, with a trim, uh, a, a range of trims settings for the uh, the uh, the elevator on the on the tail assembly. Uh, you can do the same on a human powered air, uh, aircraft, but of course, uh, if you have a um, 
uh, a deflected um, mo uh, control movable control surface, um, uh, and you direct um, uh, move it away from its uh, uh, neutral uh, angle of incidence, then you're going to create drag, and drag is the enemy of uh, all human powered flight. Uh, so you really, which is why uh, these machines are designed with the central gravity very close to the neutral point uh, uh, of the main wing. Uh, so yes, we can um, uh, we can recover this um, migration of the uh, central gravity uh, a couple of ways. Um, we uh, well, there are a couple of, uh, several ways we can deal with this. Uh, we can. <laughs> Um, uh, make the modifications uh, less than it was, bring it back closer back to uh, its original standard. Uh, we could potentially move the wing itself, uh, uh, change its mounting points. Uh, we can aerodynamically uh, control it by um, uh, the uh, uh, a trim position on the stabilator, which I've already talked about. We don't like that because it creates more drag. We could also put a small amount of weight uh, in the tail. Uh, to do that, it would only be a very small amount of weight, somewhere in the order of 100 grams perhaps, but again, not very nice because uh, uh, kilos equals watts, uh, and uh, if you don't look after the grams, then the, uh, all of a sudden it turns into kilos, and all of a sudden you've got another four, three or four watts to, to generate. Uh, alternatively, we could just draft in taller pilots and uh, <laughs> uh, and everyone would, would then fit or surgically alter the ones we've got. Uh, but um, yes, um, possibly a um, uh, an ill-advised move. But uh, I think we've got several options to uh, uh, to recover that and make it um, uh, an aircraft that's more uh, that's uh, accessible to all. And, uh, and we'll not forget, of course, again, that Airglow was not, desi not de optimally designed for any particular purpose. Uh, for instance, uh, Daedalus uh, and the other aircraft that were designed uh, before them, the Gossamer aircraft, were optimised specifically for a particular flight. Um, Daedalus uh, was... Uh, constructed uh, such that it, uh, it, it structurally sound up to less than one and a half G uh, and it showed that um, uh, you know, when uh, encountering some fairly modest buffet uh, and turbulence uh, over the beach at Santorini uh, and that modest buffet caused it to uh, cause it to structurally fail but it had a 34 meter wingspan it only weighed 32 kilograms uh, uh, Airglow weighs in with its full wingspan that we have now at 43 kilograms, but it's a tough old bird, uh, and uh, we've uh, it's had uh, a number of different pilots. Uh, it's uh, one of its current pilots is uh, the super heavyweight of the HPO worlds and uh, keeps us uh, keeps us all in check. He's our safety pilot. Uh, if it will fly without uh, without a failure with Roger in it, then it's good for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and um, uh, it, it's persisted despite interactions with the odd twin engine light aircraft uh, <laughs> and landing in various um, uh, 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 amounts of enthusiasm. Uh, at the various angles of attack. Okay, uh, so but this. Can I just ask you just a rough picture? You showed the gearbox there. Yeah. And you obviously moved it forward from its original position. How far did you move it forward? 75 millimeters. Right. So that's all new carbon structure. So, three so inches, basically. Three inches and old money. It sits yeah. on the drawing. That so gearbox flange started about where that first right. fastener is there. Pretty much. Uh, that, that tube had just projected through. In fact, if I can go back to the other slide, I think you've just added on there, haven't you? Or have you not added on that stage? Um, well that's the... Um, that's the bracing. So I, th I think this has just come through and that was the extension, yeah. possibly. Uh, and the, the, the aluminium that's beyond that, I think you pulled that out afterwards, yeah, didn't you? That's, that's so that was just the former, so that was allowed, so it wasn't all the way out to there. Uh, the opportunity was taken to mould a uh, another um, fuzz. Mike Trulove and myself uh, spent 
both of us weren't working at the time, so we spent quite a few hours coming in at uh, PNM. Uh, first of all, we had to make the air glow fuzz symmetrical and take all the bumps out, so we did that. Got it looking very smooth, added a lot of weight to it. Uh, then uh, this is the first gel coat, I believe, or maybe the second gel coat on the opposite side. So we're doing one clamshell, then we turn it over and did the other. So PNM can now sell you a fuzz. Yeah. And they've sold one to uh, John Edgeley that built it out of carbon Kevlar, and it's rather, rather too strong, I think. It's a bit of ground looping. It hasn't broken up yet. <laughs> uh, Talking about flying airglow, a lot of our time is spent <laughs> fiddling around before we actually fly. Don't need to tell you that. You see us every day here, don't you? Uh, that's Mike Truelove doing some data controls or something. Who knows what he's doing? He's fiddling with some electronics while we wait around to fly. There's a little old ASI. Our ASI had several positions. Originally, airglow had it at the top of the king post. We've now pushed it out the side on the end of a Bronniger. It was a Bronniger one as well, haven't we? We, we, had, had, a, we had a barrier, a hang gliding barrier thing there. And uh, Mike Trulaf, who joined us in 2011 as well. I end, of, end of 2011, 2011 probably yeah. beginning of 2012. Right? Yeah, the beginning of 2012, because he came to the first um, uh, Equus Cup here. But uh, Mike's speciality is electronics. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's now doing uh, for John Edgeley's team the same that he did for us, which is, uh, uh, in, our, in our case, he redesigned the control system, made new uh, controllers, uh, installed new more powerful servos, uh, and created a rather comprehensive instrumentation and data logging pack, the size of a packet of cigarettes, and not much heavier, uh, complete with uh, airspeed, altitude, um, GPS location, um, and ba battery voltage, part heart rate, cadence, uh, and latterly, uh, just completed uh, before Chris Christmas uh, this last year, a power meter, uh, his own design, built into the uh, transmission system to replace the one that John had originally built, uh, that uh, is giving some quite uh, credible data. Uh, until it fell apart so <laughs> uh, the other day and needs rebuilding. But um, uh, power measurement uh, is becoming uh, an area which we are quite, uh, very interested in, um, if, if only from a practical um, p p perspective. Uh, if we can develop a set, uh, field of data on the power required uh, to fly air glow at different takeoff <coughs> weights and different air speeds, uh, then we can use that data to um, give uh, prospective pilots and current pilots um, uh, training targets. Uh, we've got the ergometer, which we've uh, calibrated uh, to um, uh, to the aircraft um, in conjunction with what the work that Mike had done with the power meter. Um, impatient as I am, because that was taking a long time to come to fruition, I struck a deal with Garmin uh, and acquired a set of uh, vector power pedals uh, which um, could especially bolt onto the, uh, onto the cranks uh, of the aircraft uh, and you have a little stand to one of their uh, all singing, all dancing um, cycle computers and that data logs, uh, measures and data logs uh, power as well as cadence um, uh, pedal, pedaling smoothness, um, speed, uh, global and uh, GPS position. So it's really quite a useful snap-on um, uh, piece of instrumentation that weighs you know, very, very little. Um, so that's uh, that's an area that we've been um, very interested in and are currently pursuing, uh, so that you know, we can get ourselves in a position. Uh, 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 flying the aircraft for longer uh, as we're in the UK and not richly endowed with huge uh, great desert areas where you can fly for 20 miles of a stretch in a straight line um, uh, involves flying around corners uh, not much of that has been done uh, in uh, uh, human powered air aircraft in this country um, of course there are the likes of um, 
muscular, the bionic bat, uh, amongst others that uh, have flown the uh, the triangular course for the uh, for the speed uh, records. And so they've clearly demonstrated that. Uh, and we're now starting to demonstrate an ability to fly around the triangles that are being set as tasks in this competition. Uh, but uh, <coughs> long duration flights uh, are really uh, flying in circles or flying within the bounds of an airfield. And that's another area of our um, endeavour that we'd be looking, uh, looking at uh, is to get a controllable aeroplane. Um, um, which, uh, which will allow us to do that with a degree of ease uh, and reliability. Just on that, the, the most recent thing, trying to get to turn, we had to get it to fly straight first. Um, and uh, I think for the last three years we've been working on various things to get it to fly straight. Uh, and eventually we've analysed the wing uh, and discovered there's a twist in it. We looked at, well first of all we had twists in the super tips, so we took those out on the second year, that required us to bore out uh, probably about six, eight, or about half of the super tip ribs we had to bore around the carbon, we basically... Possibly we should step back a, 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 a mark, um, when we got the aeroplane in 2011 uh, it had a 27 metre wingspan, uh, the uh, the, and the wingtip sections were approximately a metre and a half in length, each of them. And they were the ones that were supposed to rotate, and then you decide to uh, uh, follow John's advice and then block them out, and they didn't rotate. Also in the box was another set of wingtips. They were twice as long and uncovered. They, were, they had the leading edges and the ribs and everything, and they just lacked the uh, uh, mylar covering. Uh, so we looked at these and thought about it and just thought, well, we'll get on with the, with the standard ones and see how we, how we get on and then we talked about it and more and thought, okay, we we'll, um, increase span equals more, um, more wing area equals more lift, uh, that will reduce the power required to go at the same speed. Why don't we have a go at that? So let's cover them and we did so uh, in a hurry, uh, immediately prior to the first day it was, uh, it was cut. Uh, here in 2012, uh, Darren Arkwright, um, colleague at PM, uh, and myself, we actually load tested them uh, uh, on the field here uh, <laughs> immediately pr prior to, to using them, using buckets of water and um, sandbags and things. Uh, Darren pronounced them uh, as sand, and we basically stuck them on in a hurry, stuck them on with lots of masking tape, and lo and behold, yes, it did, make life, did seem to make life a lot easier when, when mm -hmm. flying. Yeah, it was a really rather well, ridiculous um, uh, hedral uh, shape that you're quite familiar with now. Uh, what we hadn't paid attention to and uh, became apparent as uh, uh, we flew it some more was that they weren't actually uh, symmetrical in shape. Uh, the right hand uh, super tip, as we decided to call them, uh, had a degree of washout uh, uh, built into it. So when we measured the uh, the left hand one, it had wash in, going in the opposite direction. <coughs> so, being desperate and slightly lazy, we tried to counter it by putting um, uh, differential angles of attack in them to try and correct this. This didn't really work, uh, and unbeknownst to us, we were already battling with uh, a, uh, a fundamental uh, asymmetry in the main wing anyway, so it was all really quite confused. Uh, and we didn't really understand it. So, uh, one thing at a time, uh, we thought, well, we know that wa uh, the, the wash uh, in each of these t tips is, is different. Uh, we should make them the same as each other. Symmetry is generally regarded as being a good thing in aeroplanes. So, we filleted the left hand super tip uh, with a rather cunning tubular um, boring jig which sleep, sleep neatly over the main spar. Uh, teeth at one end uh, and a drive onto a, a cordless electric drill at the other and we bored our way successively uh, through uh, the, the glue joints on each of the ribs allowing us then to put it on a jig table uh, uh, having using uh, space blocks taken from the, uh, uh, from the right hand wing and re reversing them and then just glue them back in the new place put it covering it all over and lo and behold we had symmetrical tips uh, subsequent to that, 
still discovering that um, um, it really wanted want to fly crab, crab uh, always wants to fly uh, your nose to the left. Uh, we investigate, we you know, did the investigation, we decided to start measuring things. We were really hoping that it wasn't going to be something fundamental like the main wing being wonky, because that would clearly involve lots of work and doing uh, what we'd done on the super tip, but on a bigger scale. We didn't fancy that at all, so we were looking at items such as the, uh, the tail feathers being on slightly skewed, which they are. Um, and the fact that maybe that there's a gaping hole on the left hand side of the fuselage and not on the right hand side, I mean, that was causing an issue as well. No, not really, it's the fact that there's a one degree twist uh, in the centre section of the main wing. Well, one degree, what's the big deal about that? And then you do the simple mathematics uh, of, of that with um, a, uh, an angle of attack on air glow, um, with this wing type and um, uh, during, during flight being somewhere in the orbit of between 5 and 10 degrees uh, and uh, lift being directly proportional uh, to angle attack and then that means you've got a, uh, a differential left to the right of anywhere between 10 and 20 percent in lift. Uh, oh, that doesn't sound very good. What will that do, Bill? Hmm. Well, that will probably uh, manifest itself in adverse yaw uh, as a result of the differential lift. Is that why we're flying sideways? Probably, yes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, okay, we'll correct that then. Uh, we did that. Um, the twist was just in the centre section. We measured, we assembled the wing step by step uh, on, uh, on the, uh, with its arranged in a uh, um, uh, a particular angle, just blocked it, blocked it up and locked, and locked it. Uh, the twist developed in the centre section but remains fixed uh, over the rest of, uh, rest of the span on one, on one side. So we decided, decided that if we corrected the twist just on that centre section, uh, even at the end plate, uh, and we could live with a differential over the three and a half metres uh, on the on the centre section, as well as the uh, the remaining 24 or 27, uh, 27 uh, 13 metres of wingspan, where it's the same as one on the other side, then it would be a lot better. Uh, so we made an adapter to uh, to change that, and it is much better. So prior to that, we've been flying with uh, our rudder on one. No, we have some marks on our. Thing and so the, we've been flying continuously with two degrees rudder all this all this time. So this is the first year we've been zeroing our rudder. It works well. Um, back to the flying. This is some early flying. Uh, usual thing. Get up early in the morning. We usually sleep the night under the wings at Kemble on some rough mats. So we we uh, set up the night before and and get up and go in the morning. Interestingly, we thought. We've got a wealth of uh, airfields uh, uh, near us uh, at Marlborough uh, who have shown me too, too, well, uh, too welcoming um, uh, of an HA project. There's the Science Museum at uh, Rawton, which is this year's airfield. Um, uh, I've been out there uh, on one occasion, the 24th, uh, watching as Bill and Darren took part in one of the scrap heat challenges and did some flying stuff. Over there, there. Thought that, that would just a job. It's literally around the corner from where us. Uh, welcome us with open arms. Uh, and they did sort of welcome us with open arms, but it came at a cost £2,000 a day, uh, corporate, uh, corporate charge. Uh, they consider so us an event. An event. <laughs> so we so said thank you, no thank you. Um, we, uh, uh, we also um, uh, I got in contact with RF Lyman, who was uh, in a close, uh, close, uh, just about to close down as an active RAF station, and uh, the outgoing management said, yeah, sure, be, uh, I'm sure there'll be no problem at all. I'll pass the details on to incoming management to uh, 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 another department, and I never heard another dicky bird from them and failed to make contact with them uh, through various channels. <laughs> However, I found up a chap called Nick Howard, the airfield manager at Kemble Airfield, our local um, uh, Cotswold Airport, uh, and they welcomed us with open arms. Um, they got a, uh, 
Uh, oh, they got a one point. Yeah, got about a mile of uh, uh, of East west. west. The great the big hump, hump in the middle, 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 which we've yet to conquer in Aglo. Um, uh, and that's where our first flights were were conducted. Uh, that being one of them. So that's that's our one of our first flights, and that's mid hump. That's at the valley. He hasn't got up the hump yet. You, you'll only get halfway up it. Roger charging. Uh, and uh, so, was this Fred's picture? Uh, I think, or was it? This was taken from uh, by one of the staff at the airfield from the tower. I yeah, think. so that was taken from the tower, and I'm running along behind, just taking snapshots. So some of the first photographs are looking up into the cockpit, because uh, I'd given up running after it with a video, because all the video came out like this. So I just had to take stills. Uh, if I can get one to come up. I think that's, yeah, it's pretty much another of the series. Uh, and a, uh, another foggy day, this is at Lasham, and this is uh, at the end of the 50th anniversary. A bit of flying in the fog. A lot of cleaning, wet towels went into that, getting off the dew. We're 50th, still anniversary, 50th anniversary of Derek Pickett's flight mm. in Sunpack on the very same airfield. Uh, so Robin and I brought the aircraft down and Bill jumped in it and had a go. I took the limelight. <laughs> <laughs> that the, that the video I put on on that flight has had all, almost, uh, I think it's had 700,000 hits. It's had a lot, yeah. That's hmm. Bill all the time looking at it. <laughs> 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 so this is still at Campbell. Uh, this is us charging down the field. Uh, here we see the javelin man. Uh, I think you can tell who that is. He's about to uh, give it a, a severe hoofing. Uh, uh, me off. And he's perilously close to the um, rudder. I'm uh, surprised he didn't get that because he, he got so uh, he got Bill uh, earlier on in the week. So my failing to get out of the way. But that, that's Mike Trudeau about to launch me. Uh, and that, that's probably the first time we put the super tips on. So that's here at Gimbal in the dusk, uh, at Lasham in the evening. And that's it developing this big sweeping curve. So that's, that was on the hill, up on the hill, wasn't it? Uh, Over the grass. Yes, that's across the grass. Those are the pictures I get from running along and in fact, actually, I must be on a bike because I'm in front of it because there's no way I'd have got in front <laughs> if I wasn't on a bike. That's a rare shot, actually. That's why I took it. I thought, there's no shots looking back in. I'm approach. And so I needed to get out in front, and I got out in front on the bike. I think that's here, actually, too. And so you could also have that picture afterwards for an article. Sure. Roger. And you can see this is our attempt at uh, taping up and getting rid of the wash-in giving it a bit of wash out, but we used parcel tape, which we use on everything, and unfortunately it's a little too stretchy. We did have some fiberglass tape, but it wasn't quite enough to do the job. Uh, so in re rebuilding the main, the main wing, we had thought of filleting again, but we realised how much work that was, so we've just offset in a, in a plug. So um, one of the things that, uh, I'm going to get on to a slightly different topic, uh, but we've got some more video of, of Airglow. But one of the things I was talking about here, and the, the conversation is about flying Airglow, is the French came up on whichever day it was, saying, should I fly tomorrow in the wind? What's your advice? And I'm thinking, these guys have never flown in an aircraft, let alone uh, a human-powered aircraft, and let alone with the wind. So one of the things I suddenly thought, we actually really need to publicise what we know as pilots and hang gliding pilots of how to handle aircraft so that universities and the schools can get it right. Uh, and it's something we, whenever we bring our people in to train with us, we go over it very quickly. So we've actually got quite a good way of training people now, of take them out, show them around the aircraft, show them where to handle it, and then talk through procedures. So I thought I'd show this procedure stuff, and we should publish this on the BHPFC. Wing handling. And, and one of our training, we've kind of gone about writing a training manual, which we've kind of never worked with, but we both thought about it. And one of our procedures is everybody, even pilots, learns how to 
in the team learns how to handle the wing, learns how to handle the aircraft. So you, I think everybody here knows this because I can look around the room and see you're most ex all experienced, but cause of your wing, my wing, changeover is really important on the wing handling. Your fuzz, as in handing over the fuselage when we got, we're just doing that, my fuzz. Clear prop when we jump in. I think we have managed to smack someone on the head at one point. Just as you jump in, you're clipping in your feet. You've got, I think it was me. You've got, a, you've got a, you know, you've got a two to one ratio. So a small movement on your feet gives a, at least a half revolution on the prop and it'll swing around and get you. The other thing that we're doing with launching is uh, checking with handlers and, and calling your actions because we've taken off once without someone chasing and, and running around grabbing bikes while the well, air glows halfway down the airfield and then you've got to catch up. It's all a bit scary. Uh, so uh, yeah, we, we, we're getting better at calling our procedure, looking at who's there, who's doing what, who's going to be chasing. Uh, and we've, I see Mike's taking it through to AeroCycle, his calling of walking and running or walking, rolling. And going through uh, the other thing of, of not, not overpowering cycling as you go. So you're just spinning up the prop, call out, all out, all out. And all out, all out is from a hang, a hang gliding and a, and a gliding term of, of, of your towing instructions. So it's usually for uh, uh, your instruction over the radio for the winch to, to, to haul you up. Uh, pilot or javelin man, often, I, I'm often calling a release on the javelin. So I don't know if the pilot can hear it, but it's just to let him know that I've released. And if I've got wing handlers with me uh, when I'm on the javelin man, I want them to release as well. Because if I start giving a last little push on the, on, on the, on the uh, fuselage, I don't want one wing just to get caught out and pulled down. So if they haven't released, you'd hope they're going to release. Uh, and then I just threw some stuff up here about what you do as a pilot. You're getting up and then you're easing back on the controls. It was mostly for inexperienced people, but uh, we don't have so many today. And also, people have been asking about what it takes, and I think this is a, something that Robin had put up previously about what everybody goes on about it. But there's our table of pilot weight and uh, takeoff <laughs> weight. And I don't know if that's still current. Will you still agree with those numbers? I think I've pulled it out yeah, of a document. That's about, that's about right. So that's making that, and that's on the basis of an aircraft that weighs somewhere in the order of 40 kilos, because your, your, the power required to get you into the air it has to include the aeroplane as well. It's the, it's the max, it's, it's the all up weight that you're, that you're providing power uh, to get into the air. So if you, uh, if you're, uh, uh, the combination of the aircraft weight and your weight equals 100 kilograms working on a basic human powered um, rule of uh, power rule of thumb of between 3 and 3.5 watts per kilogram uh, then you're liable uh, to produce uh, uh, between 3 and 350 watts in order to maintain uh, flight uh, in that aircraft depending on its um, uh, on the efficiency of the aircraft um, and, uh, and conditions. So just to, get to show some of the things we were talking about earlier um, on, on a, hopefully I can get some YouTube video up here um, on high wind flying, the difference it takes. We've got a really good video that Fred did, I uh, might have listened, or maybe the, the one below is from Fred. Anyway, one of them, there's a video of us flying in high winds. Definitely Fred's. Uh, and the photo, just if, you, if you're asking, is uh, Cywell. Um, I believe that's the Cywell photo. So I'm just hoping this guy's connected to the net internet and I can bring him leaving. Sorry? You want to look at that now? If we could, I can probably. If, if you can get up on that one and we switch it over, maybe. Yeah, if you put the um, lead back into.
Clock's up.